Hi everyone, uh, it's Hassan Rajwani here from the Ref6 podcast. I am joined by my co-host, as always, John Wilkes. Hi there, how's it going? Um, John, how are you? you? Doing all right? Yeah, yeah, all right. Just plodding around, really, keeping fit. You know, the usual things. It's been a tough Christmas in terms of eating loads and January had to get back into it. But No matches <laughs> to uh, show. Now. No matches to show the lack yeah, of... exactly. Christmas, so, okay. Um, got away with it today we're joined by two guests um uh daryl do you want to introduce yourself yeah i'm daryl uh level five referee from the afa um and i'm the referee secretary of the southern amateur league brilliant and guy uh, yeah i am guy i'm a level seven referee on the promotion scheme in the season uh, based in the lincolnshire referee association brilliant um guys thanks so much for for joining uh, I, I guess similar to john just uh, trying to keep fit or watching many, much football matches at the moment? Yeah, I mean, watching a lot of football, trying to keep as fit as we can without um, eating too much. But, you know, trying to just uh, get through day by day, really, waiting for football to return. Yeah, I've been out running a lot, kind of like four or five times a week just to keep me fit and everything. Um, but quite looking forward to uh, the Champions League returning. I'm, as a West Brom fan, I'm kind of <laughs> I'm sick of the Premier League right now and looking yeah. for a competition to sit and watch. So. Yeah, I might, I might adopt a, um, a European team to, to support because I'm a Newcastle fan and we have not had a good run at the moment. So I feel you. Um, well, we're, we're 70 seconds into the podcast, and that was how long it took Mike Dean to send out to take out a red card last night. So maybe that's a good place to start with. Um, I feel really sorry for the, the, the Southampton player. If anyone's not watched this, spoiler alert, Man U uh, trounced Southampton 9 0. Um, but there were two red cards in the game. Mike Dean was the referee. The first one was for a player called Alexander Jan- Jankowicz, who was making his Premier League debut um, and within 75 seconds, I believe, had made a, a collision with uh, a challenge on uh, McTominay. And yeah, keen to get your thoughts before, you know, you know, giving a roundup of this incident. But um, go on, Guy, you look like you. You wanted to share some feedback on this one. The fun story is with the whole Jankovic thing is I saw in the Athletic last week that because he wasn't getting much game time at Southampton, they put in a transfer request. Okay. Um, at the weekend, they brought him on as a second half substitute. And then they obviously had a bit of an injury crisis. And then they start last night. So transfer request, okay, we want you to stay. So we'll give you some game time. And then boom, 70 seconds in. But having watched it back, Mike Dean is in a great position. And obviously it's a horror challenge. And if you look at kind of the pictures circling on social media as well, of Scott McTominay's leg, it is a real, real nasty collision. And you know, you feel sorry because he's just late. You know, he's gone for the, you know, he's going for the ball. He's high. He's late. But yeah, it's it's a red card regardless if it's the 80th minute or 70 seconds in. There you go, Daryl. I don't know if we can expand on that, but go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't watch the game live, so I've seen replays. Um, but straight away, even in real time, you can tell that it was it was dangerous. It was excessive force. Um, He's, he's gone in very high um, and, and straight away I was like, yeah, it's a, it's a red. And then obviously looking at the slow-mos, looking at the pictures from the aftermark, um, you know, and as Guy said, you know, Dean had a perfect position on it. Um, and it just shows how, how referees have got to be switched on from, from the first moment. Um, and he didn't hesitate, red card straight away. And it was the right decision. I think that's the key thing from this for me was <laughs> it's always hard to make those types of decisions early on, um, you know, you might be thinking, okay, well, I've got 89 minutes left of this game. Can I manage this situation? Sometimes you just can't manage them. John, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I, it's a bit of a tough one. I always find, as like myself, whenever I give it that first big one, I sort of calm down a lot. Sometimes you're always waiting for that challenge or thing to go in so you can calm yourself down and be ready a little bit. Um, but yeah, last night he was a bit. It just seemed like he was very excited to be on the pitch, <laughs> and then just was a little bit too excited. And like he never like some challenges that are red cards. You think you've done that almost on purpose with a real vengeance. Whereas it it was high, it was dangerous, but it wasn't like it looked like yeah. a player that hadn't played for a while. 
Yeah, exactly. It wasn't like malicious. It was just like he just seemed a little bit too excited, got a little bit too involved, and it just sort of ended his night early. Yeah, let's hope he uh, can come back for that and get back in the team. Otherwise, it might be a long route back for him to the first team with yeah. all the injuries. Um, there's two other... So there was another red card uh, later on in that game. We'll talk about that alongside the David Luiz one from the Arsenal game shortly because they're fairly similar, I would hesitate to, to guess, but we'll see. we'll see what everyone else says. The Leno one. So, again, it was kind of crazy. There was... I couldn't remember a game where there was two red cards for the same team for a while and then two happened in the same night. So Arsenal played Wolves away. If you haven't seen Moutinho's goal, it's a cracker. You should definitely check it out. But in the 72nd minute, after David Luiz had been sent off in the first half, um, uh, the goalkeeper Leno had came come out um, to try and basically clear the ball away, misjudged it completely and basically swung an arm at it to get it out of the way of uh, Adama Traore's uh, path, basically. No no real defenders in sight. They're all running back fairly, you know, a good 10, 15 yards to the side of Traore. So I'm keen to hear your thoughts because I've gone back and forth on this and I'll, t- I'll tell you why. I think it's a pretty straight and forward, clear cut penalty, um, uh, decision in terms of red card, but I'm really keen to hear your thoughts. Were you adamant? Easy red card for you. Daryl, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I do feel sorry for him because he's come out and he's, he's gone to try and either head the ball, kick it or chest it. One of the, one of the three. Um, but he's misjudged the bounce um, and it's sort of, um, it's gone to hit his arm. And, and by the looks of the replay, he's gone to move his arm. But by doing so, he's, he's, he's knocked the ball out of the way. Um, you know, the assistant referee had a brilliant position. Um, right on the corner of the box. And I, I don't think um, Craig Paulson had any other choice but to send him off. Cool. Guy? Yeah, it's just kind of, it's, it's the natural human instinct, isn't it? I think, you know, he's, he's obviously trying try to move his arm away or it's the kind of the realisation that I'm not getting my foot onto this. Can I do something? You know, for that split second, you forget this camera's there. You forget that you're only about 10 yards away from the assistant referee. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate one, really, and it's, it's it's a comical red card. You know, we we all everyone enjoys a comical red card. You know, <laughs> social media kind of erupted as soon as that incident happened. You know, texts are flying around. Uh, but yeah, it's just unfortunate. But yeah, good decision. It has to be done, unfortunately. And so the reason I'm slightly hesitant here is, for me, Dogzo. A few years ago, they clarified the criteria for Dogzo, right? And this is what the handball's for, right? Dogzo. That's what it's for. So it's the proximity that the attacker has to the ball, proximity of defenders, um, proximity of and direction the 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 the, the attacker's going in, etc., um, and control of the ball. So to me, when I play through those four things, and if I take it out, if it wasn't Leno but it was another defender. I think, well, hold on a minute. The attacker hasn't really got control of the ball here. He's still got a five, six yards. But I guess, and, and so in my head, I'm, I'm looking for all of those different criteria and thinking, well, I'm not sure that is Dogzo. But then I keep what I w- watched it back two, three, four times. I'm like, well, he's almost certainly going to get the ball. He's going in the direction of the, the goal and there is no defenders around him. I think it is clear red card, but I think going through that checklist is useful for every dogzo decision. John, you you were kind of nodding away, not sure. Um, I think there are a lot of factors in play. And I think I was speaking to someone about it last night, that do you think that he gets the ball because it's a Dharma Triore and you know how quick he is? Yeah? Because yeah. if you take it out of context, if that's Jean Martino, no offence, he's probably not making it. Yeah. But you, we all know how rapid he is. So does that then make it a dogzo? Because we, but then we're obviously justifying a variable we shouldn't do. We shouldn't justify pace um, of player, um, which I find quite interesting. Um, But that would be the key one that was discussed quite yesterday. Like, are we assuming that the player gets it just because of who he is? So are you, so how big was this group of people you were talking to? Was it just one person last night or a few referees? No, there was a few of us on that. Okay. So what was the conclusion? Was it, it's a clear red card or there was Yeah, yeah. No, we think it's the red card, but we do think that the pace of, Triore plays a factor in that. Okay. Like, like Craig Pawson will know how quick he is. Yeah. Everyone knows how quick he is. 
like on for like our level, we don't know the players' speed that well. We can't judge that well, so it might be slightly more difficult to sell. Yeah. Um, because Leno can almost hit the swivel and turn around. Um, and then beat the player it's, if the player is slow. Like, there is that element of potentially happening, but I think the speed of Toro makes it easy, really. I think there's... Yeah, I, I, look, I think it's definitely a red card, but yeah. I think having going through those checklists and those processes is always useful for referees to do. I think historically, anyone, you know, as football fans, anyone or a lot of people think that a goalkeeper handling outside of the box is automatically a red card. It isn't. It's a definitely potentially a deliberate handball, so it's a yellow card. But you have to factor in, okay, why would you send this off? Is it, and realistically, the only time that you can make a, a red card decision if it's dog zone and you've got to go through that. So definitely, um, yeah, interesting. I, I'm really keen for anyone who's listening, please tweet us and let us know, like, are we completely overanalyzing it? Was it just a straight red card and just stop talking about it? Or were you thinking through those factors too? So definitely give us a shout. So I'm going to move on to the uh, two penalties. Um, so I'll just describe both of them fairly quickly, um, and then we can talk about them. So the first one was in the last minute of the first half of the Arsenal match, where a through ball has seen uh, the Wolves player get through, and David Luiz is um, trying to get back and collides or legs touch the defender, uh, the attacker. The attacker goes down and a penalty is given. Um, and then it's a very similar incident in the Man U Southampton game where Marshall's gone through and Bednarak, who's in my fancy team on the bench, so I'm really hoping he doesn't get bumped up into my team, um, has made a slight contact with Marshall. I, I, I'm waiting to hear what everyone else thinks of that because a lot of people have said maybe it's a dive or not. But they both, they, let's say they both made contact and they both ended up in a penalty and both a red card after um, VAR review for Benarak. I'm not sure about Louise. Was that after, was it just a straight red? I think it was a straight red. There was no VAR, yeah. Before I go on and talk about this, what I would like to just highlight is Craig Pawson on both red cards showcased just like great teamwork. Because what you'll notice is the red card just doesn't come out. You just see him like take his time, think about it and he's definitely talking with his assistant on both both sets both of the assistants because they were both at either end um and that was just i thought great teamwork and great example of of, of having that conversation taking it slow uh, john i'll start with you what do you think of these challenges and, and let me the reason i want to talk about them is there's a few different things people talk about or i've seen tweets about oh accidental contact um, deliberate attempt of playing a ball or not, and then possibly even diving or simulation. So, what? Let's start with Louise, John. What do you think? Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of that thing about accidental, and there is nothing in the law that states anything about accidental. I think it's unfortunate, but he does clip Neto on the way through, and Neto is square on goal, and. He, Louise hasn't made a genuine attempt to play the ball, accidental or not. He's not attempted to play it, so therefore it's a red card because he's not. A, it's not a genuine attempt. He's taken the guy down. It's through on goal, and all he's got is Leno in front of him. So yeah, I think that's an easy red. Um, the second one, um, I think, is fairly similar. When I first saw it, Martial does look like he's going down, but the guy almost steps across him and sort of does the work for him. Um, and then Martial hits the ground and he's what six seven yards out from goal yeah um, so you easy. can't say that that's not an obvious goal score so no, no question for you easy for you for both no no I think both of them are easy red cards I think there is an air of unfortunate thing for David Luiz because they're both running yeah and he's clipped him yeah, yeah. but he hasn't made a genuine attempt to play the ball so you know he lives and dies by the rules okay Daryl yeah, I'm with I'm with John. I mean, David Lewis. He um, he is unfortunate where he's only just slightly clipped him. Um, it probably was accidental, um, but as he said, there's nothing that mentions accidental in the laws of the game. Um, you know, and under the letter of the law, um, it is a red card um, because there was no uh, attempt to play the ball. Um, same with with 
you know, the the Man United game, um, you know, it, this this one threw me because um, I watched the replay, um, and, and Mike Dean it appeared that he blew blew for the offence and pointed to the spot, um, and then the replay cuts to him reviewing the, the pitch side monitor. He then comes out um, again, points to the spot, um, and then brandishes the the, the red card. Um, so. I, I'm sort of with, with that one. I don't know. You know, did he did he caution him initially? Because if he if he did, he didn't. Um, you know, bring out the yellow card again and say, right, I'm cancelling the yellow card out. I'm turning it into a red after reviewing it. Um, so I, I don't know if it was initial caution or whether he just you know gave a penalty and and wasn't going to give a card at all. You know, yeah. so um, it, it's good that that he's he did take a long time to review it as well. Um, but you know, from my point of view, after looking at both of them, you know, both of them are, are dismissals. So I think you bring up a good point about Mike Dean's piece. So I think he gives a penalty and gives no card. So in my head, what he's if I translate that into my interpretation of what he's given in law is he's thought it's a clumsy challenge and there's no dogzo, there's no dogzo uh, criteria here for it, right? And yeah. therefore there's no yellow or red card because it's not reckless or it's not excessive force. So what I would imagine is Graham Scott, the VAR on the night, called him over and said, I actually think this is a dog's o, um, and it, and therefore it should be a red. Um, and so he's reviewed that. And, and that's what I think happened. Um, Guy, what, what about yourself? Anything to add on those? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's, unfortunately, the VAR is an unfortunate thing there. Because I think if that's happening on a Sunday morning, a team 6-0 down with yeah. two minutes to go, and as you can see, there's no malice in that challenge. It's not tripped him. It's just the coming together. Um, without the VAR, that is, you know, it's a penalty. Unlucky, mate, you know, go on, you know, teammates at 7-0 potentially. But then because I, it looks that, I think that's what Mike Dean seen is there's no malice in the challenge. It is just, you know, an unfortunate, you know, kind of coming together penalty. And then obviously VAR's in his ear is, oh, was that a denying clear goal scoring opportunity? Um, so I think there is a kind of... Uh, that, that's an unfortunate for Bednarek there because that is basically what's happened of just yeah, sticking with the laws even in the 88th minute when your team are already 6-0 down it is you know poor Southampton really so you've got to go for it but then you look at it and the ball is, the ball is gone it's about a yard in front of Martial and he gets Martial and there's nowhere near the ball so I guess unfortunately you can't use the excuse of he's tried to play the ball there and it's only yeah. a yellow card so. and none of us think at all there's any form of simulation here um, no. I feel like he's, he looks like he's going but you can't guarantee that and the player has already wiped him so I think I mean? slow it's not like he's down under no contact yeah I think slow-mo makes everyone look like they're diving because they're going yeah. at such a pace and you know we see like a tiny clip but in reality that actually does cause you know issues right like if you're travelling yeah. at pace etc so I, I do think slow mo makes everyone look like oh wait hold on a minute that does look like a dive but it, no to me it wasn't I think they were both reds so here's the thing they were both so we we introduced this thing around uh, triple jeopardy and well if they made a genuine attempt to play the ball then therefore you know it's a yellow card and not a red in both these scenarios there wasn't genuine attempt to play the ball they weren't even careless foul they were careless fouls right they weren't really going to get a yellow card if they were anywhere else on the pitch right so in my head as Daryl was talking I came up with a new idea for law and then basically killed it straight away <laughs> which is in those scenarios why not just wait till the play the, the penalty's been taken and then give the yellow and red right if they miss the penalty okay let's just give them a yellow if they uh, let's give them a red. If they score the penalty, let's give them a yellow. So they have something like that in rugby, like penalty try kind of is slightly different as automatic goal. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask you guys, what do you think of that? But then if I'm a team, I'm just going to miss it on purpose. So I get the guy sent off and, and carry on. So yeah. I, feel like I killed my whole idea in, in two seconds. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there's, it feels because we've added this whole deliberate 
play on the ball or j- attempt to play the ball or not, it feels like every careless foul should end up being just a yellow. But it that's why I feel like this this has caused some debate, even though in law they, these were completely correct. So, yeah. Do you think there's going to be like a, not a U-turn, but, you know, you saw similar with like the other week with the Man City <laughs> officer? Um, Sorry. <laughs> again. Uh, well, obviously, yeah, it was, it was, there was kind of a loophole in the rules there, and then the Premier League came out and said, right, this has happened. You know, we back you know, the referee in the decision, but from then on, this is what's going to happen. Do you think there's going to be anything like that at all with these challenges? Because, you know, it seems like two unfortunate challenges there that have been red cards. What I find like, fascinating, sorry, John, what I find fascinating fine. is things happen in like, like buses, they come along all at the same time, all around the same type of topic, right? It's crazy. So like the offside that happened in the Man City game, and I guess the same one that happened in the Man City West Brom game and the Villa game, they all both happened at similar times. Um, they're, they're very interesting. And I think there was a couple other incidents that were similar as well around the offside. I don't think, we haven't really talked about the offside uh, on, the, on this podcast, but I don't think what was given was a change of law like or the stance isn't a change of law it's a change of interpretation right so my personal opinion was that should have been an offside the 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 specific one i'm talking about is i think it was rodri coming back from an offside position challenged tyron mings as soon as he got the ball to me like as soon as everyone feels has that feeling that it's wrong that shouldn't be allowed that should be the the law, right? And it and it was the law, and I think the interpretation was potentially wrong on on the day, and and I guess it's proven that in 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 coming coming out, these are different. I just think these are completely unfortunate that they happen both on the same night, um, so it's kind of yeah. made them bigger. I think if they were um, and no disrespect, if they were a Newcastle player and a Barnsley uh, a, a Burnley player. I don't think we would be talking about them that much because it was Arsenal and Arsenal lost because it was Man U and it was a nine nil game. It was kind of a crazy game. I don't personally think they will change anything, but I'm not sure. Do you, do you think they should? And if they should, what, what would you change it to? I don't think they'll change it. I don't think there's a need to change like that. The whole, they brought in, I don't know when it was, but they brought in that genuine attempt to play the ball. And I think that was a game changer with the whole uh, double jeopardy thing because it's easier for us to be like, why have you only given a yellow ref? And I went, well, he went to play the ball, fella. And you know, obviously you'll get a few like, no, he did, and yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, but I think that it makes it so much easier for us to sell. It has. Uh, go on, guy. I, I feel like you've got an idea, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah it's just a tough one, isn't it? Because like, if David Luiz had gone in there, jumped off the floor, and just absolutely wiped him out, he's getting a red card. Yeah, and still getting the red cards with that kind of slight clip of yeah. the So I think, especially lower down the football pyramid, I think it's harder as a referee to sell that as a red card when there's no VAR. You know, like I put it back to Sunday morning, and you've got you know 22 blokes on a Sunday morning. You're know, sending a player off for that because by law it's true. Is you know a hard sell um, when you know it's just been an accidental clip of the the knee compared to absolutely wiping someone out through on goal in the 18 yard box. I think you bring up a great point. It's not one that we were going to plan on talking about today, but I might because Daryl's on, he's a referee secretary. Do you think, this is maybe personal, you can, you can answer it in your personal capacity as a referee or your role as a referee secretary. I'll give, you, I'll give you those options. Do you think you can referee games differently at different levels of the pyramid? So what Guy has just mentioned, like that David Luiz incident, if that happens on one of your Southern Amateur League games in the bottom division would you expect a red card by the referee even though a red card is correct could could a referee ever manage that you don't have to answer in your official capacity you can just <laughs> me me, pers- me personally um it falls down to player expectation you know um and the expectation of the referee at that level um and it is it does differ up and down the pyramid mm-hmm. um i think in the in the premier league with var there's no hiding. It's got to be by the book because the moment it's not, um, you know, all hell will break loose. Let's be honest. If if Mike Dean didn't send um, send the player off, um, there would have been all calls about the referees being um, 
not showing consistency because mm-hmm. it was two things on the same night within a couple of hours of each other. So, um, yeah, I think I, I think it can be managed. You know, if it's over in you know in London in Clapham Common on a Sunday morning, you know, there's going to be very little complaints if you're just going to show a yellow card. Um, if if you're say supply league or contrib. Um, and then going up slightly higher than that, then, you know, the expectation is going to be it's, it's a red card. Um, but I think at grassroots level, um, there, there can be the... Um, the you, you, can, you can manage the game um, differently at grass, grassroots. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's my, that's my personal view. OK, cool. No, I, I agree with you. And I think context is king here. Because if it's top of the division, even if it's Sunday league, top of the division class, it's one all. I think it's a red, even on a Sunday league, right? But if it's six nil like this and it's three minutes left, I think I can consider managing it. Like, I I know that's probably not the official stance that referee development officers or referees would want to see. But I think that is specifically like... (laughs) Someone, uh, an elite referee once said, what is your goal as a referee on a game? And his word was survival. Um, so to me, <laughs> that is a prime example of a way to survive the game is to give a yellow in the, that time. But in the Premier League, it has to be a red, definitely, completely. Cool. So we, um, let's shift gears a little bit. So um, keen to kind of talk about the role of a ref- referee secretary and then how referees kind of keep on a good side of a referee secretary, I guess, maybe, or how new referees figure out what leagues to do in their area and stuff like that. So um, I've been refereeing for a long time uh, and all of us have now. So um, Guy, do you want to talk about, um, can you remember back to like how you find what leagues to go on and how you get in touch with the referee secretaries and stuff like that? Yeah, so I did my course uh, in 2012 when I was 16 years old. So at 16, it was just kind of like the local kind of, it was called it's the Midlinks Youth League. So it's, uh, I think, any football under 16s. And on the course, they gave you the contact. And because you were this new referee, you just got in contact with them. Uh, but getting back, so I had two seasons doing that uh, with the old men's game, just through kind of uh, people. And it's very, ne- uh, refereeing at lower level is very much of a networking thing. And I think it's very much like a snowball effect is, you know, you referee some team they take your details and then when referee pulls out one morning or there's a last minute friendly you know you get the phone call um, and I think it's about kind of like being reliable I think is the main thing um, and being on the good side of the referee secretaries as well always seems to help so uh, yeah it's getting into them it's just it's, it's networking it's you know speaking to fellow referees how do you get into this league uh, and then you know introducing yourself kind of via email or telephone to try and get in because uh, especially in Lincolnshire there seems to be more games being played than there are referees so, or, which is good for a referee point of view because you can do as many games as you kind of want to do which is yeah. which I think I predict that with the impact of the pandemic on everyone's finances I think next year refereeing will either see a big influx of new referees or we'll see referees trying to do more and more games just to you know get pick up a little bit of extra cash on the side I, this is just a complete guess but no that's the I- um, since August and what, uh, November and a little bit of December, I managed to officiate uh, 54 games uh, between okay. that. So it was just, you know, pandemic, being a full-time student was just, as long as I can get there, as long as you're paying me, um, yeah. I'm, I'm there, I'm doing it. So, yeah, I completely agree with that. Interesting. So, uh, Daryl, what, 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 um, can you talk us through how do you find out or how do you get in touch with new referees or is their role to get in touch with you? And then can you just give an, a quick insight into the role of a referee secretary? Or are they like, how important is the referee secretary? A lot of us don't see what goes on behind the scenes. So really keen to just get a couple minutes of what, what you do. Yeah. So, I mean, um, getting new referees onto, onto leagues is, um, the, it's the job of, of the league to obviously recruit those referees um, and how they do that. Um, all depends on, on their relationship with, with the people that are doing the courses um, that are run by county FAs. So having a good relationship from, from a referee secretary point of view with your RDO or your um, the football development manager at the county FA is, is really good because 
when they're running the courses, um, you know, you want your league's name to be there to say, right, this is one of the good leagues to go to. Um, you know, get in touch with this person. They'll point you in the right direction. Uh, you know, and, and now it's all online. So they'll just give you a website address. You go online and you register online. And then, yeah. you know, as a referee secretary, I'll get in touch with them. Um, and then it's, it's getting them onto the league and, and making sure that they feel comfortable, um, that you're giving them the, the right kind of games at the right kind of clubs. You know, if you've got a club that's, I don't know, it's got a poor discipline um, history, you're not going to send a, a brand new 16-year-old referee over to a club that's got a really bad discipline record. You're going to send them to somewhere that you know they're going to look after them. Yeah. Uh, especially with the you know post-match hospitality that we uh, shout about in our league. You know, we, we're going to want them to look after them. And even if they spend their first five or ten games there um, or between two different clubs. Um, it's just a way of slowly introducing them to the league. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they feel comfortable and they sort of get their, their, their feet on the ground and, and they know what they're doing, then we can start introducing them to the rest of the rest of the, the clubs around the league, you know, depending on, on their ability and, and what division they're doing. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's all about having a, a good relationship with the county. Um, you know, if you're not if you're not on talking terms with your your county FA RDO or your your football development manager, they're not going to put your name forward for for new referees coming. They're going to send them somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's being proactive. You know, there's there's nothing stopping you as as a referee secretary turning around going, I, I want to go to the next referees course and I want to stand up and tell them why to join the Southern Amateur League. Yeah, brilliant. And do you go and see? Well, I know you still referee, but do you have uh, any people that go and watch people in the new in the new of the new referees in their first few games, or um, is that the county's role? Um, it's it's more the county role. Um, I mean, I'm an active referee, but I'm also uh, an observer, so I go out and observe some weeks as well, um, and um, that that will be obviously promotional candidates that I'm observing, but. You know, a, a new referee may be in the in the same ground that I may be able to catch half hour of, of their game to to have a look and watch them. Um, but then, obviously, the county uh, have their mentor scheme, so you know any new referee that comes through will be offered a mentor. And if they take that that scheme on board, then they have someone that they can pick up the phone to, have a chat with. Um, the mentor can, you know, if they got the ability to, they can go and watch their games. Um, then it, it comes down to communication between county FA and league because if the if the referee and the mentor are both on my league, um, you know my RDO can give me a call and go any chance of getting in both at the same venue for a, a couple of weeks, um, and then after their games they can sit in the clubhouse and have a chat about each other's games and, and what was good and what was bad. Oh, brilliant, Guy. Do you um, do you you mentioned earlier that you're on the promotion scheme? Do you get much? interaction with mentors or is that something that you've got to sort out yourself or are you just going it alone in some aspect uh, yeah it's kind of going it alone at the bit but i've got a supportive on like the lincoln sunday league um the the referee secretary uh, goes and sees all the new referees and it was quite nice he came to see me um one week and you know, gave me some feedback and pointers and then the following week i was getting assessed so it felt that i got like a, a semi-assessment in before my actual main assessment which kind of timed everything quite nicely yeah that's very good Cool. And then, so, Daryl, what does a, re a week in the referee secretary role uh, look like? Is it, is it just, is it really straightforward? Do you just put names in the spreadsheet and away you go? Or I, I suspect it's a bit more than that. Yeah, I mean, so, on my league, I've got about 150 officials that are registered with us. Um, they're not all active every single week. Um, you know, some of them share their commitments with other leagues. Mm -hmm. um, they're not available every week because of work commitments or personal commitments um, and stuff like that. So um, the most important thing is to, to, to capture their availability. Um, so, you know, if I'm going to do appointments for the 1st of March, for instance, you know, normally about three weeks before to a month before I'll start, you know, knocking on their, their inboxes going, right, let's have your availability. Um, so I can sort of pre-plan mm -hmm. a, a rough guide of my, my initial appointments. Um, then probably about two or three weeks beforehand, I'll sit down and um, 
finalised my appointments across the 18 divisions that we've got. Um, you know, so it's, it, it works out about between 70 and 80 appointments or 70 and 80 games every week. Okay. Um, some of them have neutral assistance, some of them don't. So um, it's quite a lot of appointments to do and it can take, it could probably take a couple of hours to do the appointments. Um, then I upload them onto our full-time system that, that goes out to all the referees um, normally two weeks beforehand. And then I just sit there and wait. Um, there, there's, there's, you know, you get the, uh, the referee that turns around and goes, plans have changed, work's called me up, I've got to work, I'm really sorry. Um, and, and then more or less straight on it, you know, and they're normally the easy fixes. So you can um, swap them around quickly before he gets too close to the game. But, you know, in, in the last week to the run-up of the games, it's it's the hardest because you're getting referees dropping out because of injuries, mm -hmm. um, because of work commitments, um, county cup appointments that, that take preference over over league. Um, so it's important that, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough that, that my RDO does the appointments for the county cups really early on. Yeah. Uh, if he can, he'll do it two months in advance so when I do my appointments um, I know that um, that referee isn't available um, mm -hmm. referees turn around and go to me you know I've had it before where it's I don't know three or four days before the game oh, I'm not available why not oh, I'm going away I just forgot to close my dates and it's, it's really frustrating um, because it's you know a two minute job that the referee could have just you know clicked on a button and closed his date and, and he wouldn't have got appointed um, but, you know, and, and that two-minute job that he could have done or he or she could have done um, would take me probably, you know, 10, 15 minutes to, to swap around. And, and yeah. it, the time builds up. Um, you know, some people are genuine. You know, it's a last-minute decision. They're going away. Um, and especially over the last sort of... Uh, over the last year, really, um, availability has, has fluctuated up and down every single week because of some referees don't want to referee as much now because of the, the pandemic. Um, other referees want to referee more. Um, other referees are limiting where they want to travel to. Yeah. So it's finding that, you know, what referees can go to what areas of London, uh, because obviously we cover the whole of London. So it's, it's, it's quite a big area to sort of cover on a weekly basis, but yeah, it, it can, it, it's not, it's not a, a couple of hours each week it's <laughs> it, it's about six to ten hours a week at least that's crazy so do you because it's a voluntary role do you uh, do you actually get time to do anything other than that like i mentioned do you go and see uh referees like like guy said he had someone come out from the league but uh, you referee you observe that's probably really hard to do so as a league do you do anything else in terms of referees other than appointment do you do any form of like development with them or like I you know there is a clear role that the counties are playing there but I'm just intrigued if the league does anything else or do they want to do anything else but just don't have the resource right now to do it yeah so we you know um we we would love to um go out and watch referees every week if we could um I'm I'm fortunate enough to have a team around me so um I've got my assistant and then I've got or people that, that support me, um, whether it's supporting me with appointments, supporting me with administration, uh, post-match reports from referees that are coming in, um, and IT admin for, for full-time and stuff like that. So I've got, you know, five people around me that, that support me. And out of those five people, um, one of them is, is not a referee. Okay. Um, and he's, he's a a club chairman so he's obviously at his club um on a, on a weekly basis so he obviously sees referees that are at his club um but the, the rest of us are active referees um or active observers so you know we're out doing um you know refereeing for either sal or, or supply league games um or uh, observing for the county yeah. so we're, we're out watching referees in a way when we're observing but they're not necessarily ours um, so they could be observing a referee from a different league, you know. Um, so, so the last question on this stuff, 
John and I have talked about this a lot, is the match reports that you submit after games. Guy, do you have that in your leagues that you have to send in, like, not just a yellow and red cards for the whole game, but, like, marks for your club assistants and did they have pitch marks, etc.? Do you do that in your leagues? Um, so, Lincoln Sunday League, we've got to give out sporting marks for okay. how, um, how sporting the teams are. So, obviously, they can vary. Um, I think anything similar to their markings with us, I think anything under about 60 or 50 requires written work. So, any, any team has been a pain, they get an automatic 60. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> is, that all the, is that all they ask you for, is a sporting mark? Uh, yeah, in the, in the, the Lincoln Saturday League, they, there is like a... Um, when you become a level six referee, you referee on that, and they do ask about yeah, kind of the pitch marks, the 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 dressing, well, the, the, the facilities at the games, the, your um, your assistant referees. But yeah, there's nothing really too strenuous um, when it comes to like the grassroots level. So John and I have always thought that leagues ask you to do it, and it just never goes anywhere. Prove me wrong, Daryl. What what happens? With those yeah. <laughs> so we get um, we get the, the post match reports in that they give us. The marks of the assistants, um, the uh, the facility marks, uh, post-match hospitality marks, sportsmanship marks, all that sort of thing, um, and it go that that form goes to about six or seven different league officers okay. uh, that all look at their own section. Um, I sort of view it as an overall, um, but you know we, for instance, um, sportsmanship marks and and cautions and dismissals. Um, one of the people that are on my team um, is the, the discipline officer for the league and he looks at every single uh, report that comes in um, and you know all we ask is how many simbins, how many cautions, how many dismissals um, and if there is you know a, a few more than you would expect at a grassroots game um, he will go back to that referee and just go is everything okay um, you know can you elaborate on the cut the red cards you gave out, you know, and I'd say eight times out of 10, the referee will respond. Some referees don't, don't bother responding. Um, but he would also, he would always go back to them and, you know, try and find out if they're okay and, 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 and what's, you know, what's gone on in the game. Um, sportsmanship marks, discipline marks, it's all monitored on a, on a, uh, a monthly basis at our league management committee meetings. Um, it's all reported back to the to the league committee. Um, as a league, we don't actually have control over the discipline. That's obviously all dealt with by the county. Um, but we do monitor it. Um, and as a league, we can sort of, you know, intercept clubs and say, listen, you know, you're getting tight to your to your your mark where you're going to get pulled up by the county FA. You know, is everything okay? And we can break that down not only by by club but by team because obviously. In our league, you know, some of our clubs have nine teams, mm -hmm. um, so we can sort of turn around and say, right, your your fourth team is is causing a few issues recently. You know, can you have a word with the skipper and the and the team? Um, and we have had it before where where clubs have, have pulled teams out because they're just you know not following the the ethos and the sportsmanship of of the league, um, and we've we've you know jumped on that before it's reached county FA level, um, so. On our league, we do do something about it. Um, but I always turn around to the referees, you know, when I'm out and about with them, and I see him over on the, you know, over on the pitches. I say to them, listen, if you've got any feedback, got any comments, suggestions, let us know. You know, get in touch. We're we're always open to people getting in touch with us and and you know giving their thoughts um, and and feedback, and, and we're always taking it on board. Um, we have monthly referee meetings uh with with my little team of, of five or six people so we're always talking about um how the referees are doing what we're hearing from them so yeah we do stuff i know i know some leagues in the past that i've been on don't really do much of them yeah. um, but you know i i would turn around and, and stick up for 95 percent of the leagues and say they do actually pay attention to them they do look into them so it drives a ton of information so i've definitely been guilty in the past of uh maybe forgetting to accidentally not send them in. So definitely, if you're out there, make sure you do that, especially if you're like Guy, who's looking to progress up the ladder, administration is going to be key. And yeah. referee secretaries will pass that feedback on to RDOs who have to make decisions. So definitely worth doing. 
Um, the last thing I want to talk about, Guy, because you mentioned you're on promotion for this year, is did you manage to get your games in in time? You said 54 games, so I imagine you, you got all your observations in and stuff? Well, no, so well, 54, there's a lot of pre-season. There seems to be like an extended pre-season, and then there was obviously pre-season in the middle of the season. <laughs> with COVID. It was, I feel for Daryl, actually, because, you know, lots of times late on a Saturday night, I'm getting a call from the referee secretary. You know, it's a, it's a pain having frozen pitches and waterlogged pitches, and then all of a sudden we've got COVID-19 cases. You know, it's just an, an added kind of one. Um, so games-wise, I'm almost on um, my game, so I to get one observation in, uh, but find out Thursday evening. Um, we've got a meeting with the, the Lincolnshire Referee Association to see what happens. So I'm pleased I got one observation. I knew that was, um, I think, enough for promotion of people last season because of the halting in March. So I have to keep my fingers crossed for everything. And how many games did you get in that were eligible? Uh, I think it was about 14, 15. Uh, yeah, so out of, all, out of all the games, like I said, it was a big, a hectic pre-season. Um, and then, yeah, lots of friendly games in between these matches and everything. So, what do you think should happen? Because John and I have been talking about this a bit different ways. Like, Daryl, what do you think should happen? I think, um, I, I, I personally think the FA will be sensible and do what they've done last year. Um, and with the seven to five candidates, um, that is de it's dealt with and administered by the county FA. Um, so, the county FAs will will decide that on an individual basis and they'll probably lower the, the threshold for the game numbers and observation numbers. Um, and I, I think the counties will be sensible in that. Um, with with uh, five to four and above, it's it's obviously different because you've, you've got uh, the FA that administers that. You've got fitness tests to take into account and stuff like that as well. Um, rules and yeah, so no matter what happens, you're always going to get referees that, that retire referees that give it up yeah. so with them coming out of the game you're going to need fresh blood going up um, and going into them so you're going to need some kind of promotion yeah. um, the FA will, will no doubt be talking this through the referee department and they will send their information out and people will be nominated by their counties if they reach that um, that criteria but I think I think uh, you know most referees that are on promotion will will be okay. Um, there'll be the odd one or two that, that haven't met the, the required threshold, but a majority of them we will be fine, I think. I think um, you mentioned around there's going to be a lot of referees retire and give it up. I think there may have been referees this year who were thinking this would be their last year who were going to retire, who consider staying on just because they didn't get their final year kind of thing. So, But I think more, more and more people will step away, so I agree. Guy, it, you're... Um, your bias in this, but I assume you 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 assume or you want them to just let, let you get promoted now? Or? No, oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm a training to be a teacher as well. We're in the same boat at the minute with schools being closed. Is that they need? Yeah, that's the perfect kind of example. Um, Daryl said was you're going to have you know you're going to have teachers leaving and retiring. Um, they need a new fresh uh, set of people. that will be the same with referees. You know, people who drop out from refereeing, um, and yeah, it needs the the flow to continue. So. Uh, yeah, so it's actually lower down the pyramid, you know, at seven, six and fives, but would feel for any kind of referees getting relegated, you know, in ones, twos and threes, because that possibly could happen if referees are getting promoted in that level. I think I've said it before. I don't think relegation should happen for referees, but I think promotion should, and we should deal with the numbers that mess up. Unless someone's had a really horrid season, then maybe we'll see. But I don't <laughs> um, Guys, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I thought that was a really good conversation we got a lot out there we talked about the four red cards from last night um which was a great starting point for the, the conversation we talked about um the new referees coming in and how to how they should interact with the referee secretary so thanks daryl for giving us some info in uh, and some insight into the role of a referee secretary guy thanks for joining good luck with both your pgce and promotion this year and for those listening, thanks so much for listening. Next week, um, the Super Bowl is happening and we have some special guests that will be giving us an insight into American football um, and maybe things that we can look out for in the officials from, from that game. It's always great to learn from different sports, etc., and learn different things. Uh, maybe we can bring some of that into our game. But um, once again, Guy, Daryl, thank you for your time. John, Pleasure. 
And for those listening, uh, speak soon. We'll, We'll hear from you soon.